Hello everyone, my name is Joshua Gilliland and thank you for joining us for part of our special one year anniversary of the Legal Geeks. That's right, it's Legal Geeks year one and to celebrate <laughs> we have a special video podcast and for those listening, a podcast with two very distinguished judges. Uh, one who has appeared several times with us is Judge Matthew Scanaro who presides in New York, in Brooklyn right now, famous for a variety of different opinions and also known for working in Star Wars into his famous Twitter opinion. With me on the left coast and the 408 area code is Judge Paul Gruwal, uh, who presides in the Northern District of California in the San Jose Division. Uh, Judge Gruwal uh, worked in a wonderful quote about triples in a recent <laughs> opinion, which prompted the invitation. And with that, uh, we're here to discuss not electronic discovery, which we all can speak about for hours on end, not what goes into a TRO, which we could all do, but science fiction and what it means to our judges and a couple other fun little life lessons. So with that, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Josh, and thank you, Your Honors, both of you, for being here with us today. This is uh, very exciting because we are here to discuss something that I think is near and dear to all of our hearts, and that is, of course, science fiction. So I have. I thought you were going to say your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> we're not discussing my birthday, Your Honor. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> you mean my 35th birthday that I just celebrated? <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Yes, uh, my 35th birthday aside, um, we are here to discuss <laughs> my other favorite topic, science fiction. And so I'd like to ask both of you, um, just so that we kind of understand where you come from, because obviously there's a lot of science fiction out there, what is your favorite science fiction story, be it a movie, a book, a TV show? Um, and Judge, I'll start off with you, Judge Scarino, since you've already uh, teased me here about my birthday. So what's your favorite science fiction story? Yeah, I'm, go I'm going to shock you all. Oh, it's not Star Wars? Oh, wow. Time. See, if, 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 it's my, if, if it's the books and the movies together, Star Wars. But actu actual show... Babylon 5 was, was probably my favorite. And, and I think it had a lot to do with the fact that uh, in its five-year arc and in its history, I, I love that at the end, when it came to the humans having to choose between the absolute order of the Vorlons and the absolute chaos of the shadows, the extreme positions, the, the, the humans decided to chart their own course in the middle and, and, and not to necessarily follow what their parents expected and to chart their own course and their own destiny. And, and that kind of um, was the, the, the story that, I, that really, really hit me as, as being a powerful story. Wow, I've got chills from that. All right, I've never watched Babylon 5. I've always meant to, but I clearly need to add it to my list now. It's worth it because it's got a beginning, a middle, and end. It's, it's a really, really good story, even, even to the point that the, the, the last dedication of, of the last episode was dedicated to all of the people that thought that Babylon Project would fail. Oh. <laughs> that faith, faith Manages is, was, is the last words of the dedication as the show goes off the air. So even to the end, it was a big ha-ha. We, we were able to do it even though everyone said we weren't going to be able to do it. And, and that oh. faith can persevere if that's really what you want and that's your desire is a, is a strong and it was a good, good message. And I think that's a message in a lot of science fiction, but it was more than just the usual good versus evil. It's not just always the extreme, that gray area, uh, that, that chaotic neutral or neutral evil area. If you're an old Dungeons and Dragons fan, has a lot of good to it. <laughs> wow. All right. Impressive. I love that. And I do, I love what a great dedication and what a way to end the show. That is fantastic. Um, and Judge Gruel, how about you? What would you consider your favorite science fiction story? Oh, I'll go top five for Babylon 5, but uh, I guess I start with the classics. And when I say classic, I will get to Star Trek in a minute. Fear not. <laughs> we'll have plenty of discussion around that subject. But I'd have to say top of the list, absolutely number one, has to be the Twilight Zone series. A little wow. before my time, but as a little kid watching the reruns, I was freaked out by Burgess Meredith. I was freaked out by the monster on the plane, on the wing. It, it just, I think the Twilight Zone was brilliant because it really, it really, I think, forced or begged the question, 
what is real and what do we think is real? And that, that theme just kept coming up over and over again. And as a seven or eight year old, that's a pretty mind blowing concept. It's also yeah. true for 41. <laughs> um, Star Trek, again, I think there's so much to say in so little time, but it really, I thought was brilliant at asking the question over and over again, what does it mean to be human? And in so many different contexts, I think it really called, it really forced all of us to question sort of the meaning of humanity. So really, really cool. And I have to say on Star Trek, uh, one of the rare instances where I think the films were as enter- entertaining as the TV that inspired yeah. them. So that's what those would be my picks. Wow, good Twilight Zone, too. That is old school. That is not one that gets enough attention these days. I like old it. Old school, maybe just old. I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> definitely one or the other, for sure. There's no, there's no better ending than the, than the cookbook on how to serve humans. How there, to there, serve there, man. There, there, yes. there, there, there is just so many, you know, from the, the, the pig face people to, 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 you know, every episode of, of the Twilight Zone always left you with a, wow. You know, there was there was always just that fact at the end, and and Grant, yeah, I came to them late and watched them on on reruns and and afterwards, and I, I agree, it was it was a really well done, just well written, and you always left you thinking. I I would agree with that. A Twilight Zone, I remember watching when I was very young in Pasadena, and the nuclear war episode where the guy is in the bunker and then breaks his glasses left a, a very uh, strong impression. Time uh, enough at last, I believe, was the episode. Yeah. That's right. And, and then, and I, I didn't watch a lot because they bothered me. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, any, anyone who wears glasses, that is the hell. Yeah. That, that, that could, I mean, when, whenever I'm on, on any kind of ride or, or anything, it's, it's that fear of my glasses falling off if I'm on my friend's boat. The, the, looking over, I'm always like holding my glasses. I don't want them to fall into the water. And I have a lot of extra pairs, but it's still, there is, there is that, that is an ultimate fear for anyone that wears glasses. There was the other, other one where it turned out these individuals, like four or five people, one was a soldier, one was a clown. They're trapped in this, uh, you know, circular room. And it turns out it's their dolls and they're in a giant trash can. Uh, that one also left a mark of like, that was really odd somebody was really creative in coming up with that so i will bet follow up of uh first to judge scenario so serena you got serena, it. You, the uh, first time you ever killed my name I, it's <laughs> weird it's the dyslexia thing kicking in at the worst time so uh we talked about babylon 5 and i love babylon 5 a lot did you watch excalibur I, I watched Crusade. I watched Excalibur. I, I like the spinoffs. They didn't get enough time to, to really uh, hit their mark, but I, I, I thought that, um, you know, it really was a good continuation of the story. And, and I read all the, the books as well because the, the whole dichotomy of the side core um, mm-hmm. fight, I wanted to kind of see how that played out. And the books did a pretty good job of, of that war. One, one of the things that was great on, on Babylon 5 was the, the legal issues that it it discussed. I mean, th- there there was one one in particular that's probably my favorite, where a person whose great 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 grandfather had been abducted by aliens, and now was suing the 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 family of the aliens that had abducted his father off the farm those you know several hundred years ago. I mean, it, it really was was very creatively done, and that was just like a side story to the, the to the main episode that that particular uh, evening but it was it was they had a lot they had a judge they had lawyers they had uh, they had a, a couple of arcs that were literally three series of of, of trials they, they really you know got into the legal issues uh, and that's probably one of the reasons that I, I like the this, this show as well. Also, with the presidential assassination, they apparently didn't have a problem with the VP and the president traveling on the same spaceship. Right. The whole Clark's <laughs> Law stuff was great. Yeah. It's like, whoa, time out. Why? When would that be okay? So that was uh, very interesting. So the follow-up for both of you, and you both kind of alluded to this already, is when did you first see these? And, you know, I can estimate with... Babylon 5, that was at least 1993, because that's when it came out. Later. I actually didn't watch them until 98, until they hit TBS. Uh, I, I, I had caught it in the middle of the, the, the TNT 
run. And, and, and because it was either middle of season two or three, I watched like two episodes out of order. And it's really not a, a show that you can watch out of order. You got to watch it from the beginning to the end in the order that they, they intended it. And, and so it was when they went on reruns that they were running at seven o'clock on TBS and it was the perfect time for when I got home from work. And I would watch them, and, I, and, I, and it just so happened that they were starting up. So it was 98, actually, so it was late that I caught up on, on the Babylon 5 uh, universe. And then I, I wouldn't miss one, or I would record it and watch it later that night if for some reason I had a meeting or something along those lines. And then now it's one of the few shows that I actually own the DVDs and, and do rewatch every once in a while. And I have yeah, I, I, and I have Excalibur. I definitely think that when you start watching these series has a profound impact on your reaction to them, right? Because – I started watching Twilight Zone, Star Trek, these, these episodes when they were basically reruns on broadcast TV. And my sense is that if I had started watching them, say, in the modern era of, of, of DVD or, or Netflix, you'd, you'd be able to watch these entire series all at once, right? You'd mm -hmm. gobble them up in an afternoon or in a weekend. And I think, you're, I think part of the magic of some of these earlier series was was the time to think and reflect on what they were teaching and and the accumulation of the reaction right because um it's true like after a while twilight zone just freaked me out too much i had to take a break <laughs> and I think, I think my mom made me take a break <laughs> and god forbid i had just sort of I watched them from start to finish on a saturday or a sunday i don't know oh. what might have transpired <laughs> I, I just spent all day saturday watching all of uh, the breaking bad season Five, whatever the current season is, um, just one after the other after the other because I, I had I, it was a show I came to late. There's even actually now a, a word for this: watching the episodes all at once. I heard it on uh, might have been I O Nine site or, or something that for watching a show uh, continuous one episode after the other after the other. And shows now like Arrested Development have, have that's the way they're being released. Yeah. House of Cards, which I thought was phenomenal, not science fiction. But House of Cards, Netflix released all of them at once, and I watched the first, and then it was like nonstop. And then I watched the British edition and, and, and all that. But th I, there is something to be said for the continuous, but yeah, you, you really don't get a time to digest and think about it. It's more of, okay, let, let me re see the next one. Let me see the next one. Let me see the next Total one. Total immersion. It is. It is. It's fun to do every once in a while. <laughs> And yeah. you should do it for Babylon 5. I'll do it for that. Twilight Zone, I agree. I think I would need to spread those out, watch those on a pleasant, sunny afternoon where I have several hours to, like, calm down before bedtime. I think that would be a hard one to watch right up yeah, until I mean, Think about it, Jessica. Think about it. Like, would you want to be the criminal defendant appearing in front of his honor after he just consumed 12 Twilight Zone episodes <laughs> in a row? I don't think so. I, <laughs> that, that is not I would want. That is not the day I'd want to have where I was standing in in front of a judge. That's a good point. We always need to start adding this to judicial <laughs> ethics that you can't watch certain shows before Excuse me, Your Honor, or... what did you watch last night before? <laughs> yeah, I mean, just think about it, right? Our, our next set of disclosure forms are going to be what episodes we watch in what order. It's coming, I guarantee it. <laughs> wow, you're right. Some of these shows could have a serious impact. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, the videos that Robert Bork rented clearly had an impact on a lot of things, uh, and those 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 privacy laws and and and, and uh, still to this day come into play with uh, with various decisions and stuff. Yeah, but yeah. It's, it's tough to imagine a Senate confirmation hearing about your Netflix instant queue. <laughs> and that would be. But 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 interestingly, even on that, because of the Bork law that was passed because of the, the disclosure of the videos, Netflix actually had to get a tweak in the law passed, which allows you from Netflix now you can share on Facebook or Twitter what you're watching on Netflix if you so choose. But just to be able to do that, the law had to be amended to allow Netflix to have that ability. And it was only done in the beginning of this year. Wow. So getting back to the Twilight Zone, let's talk about Twilight Zone and Star Trek a little bit for a moment, Your Honor. I mean, was there one story in either one of those? Twilight Zone, obviously, I think we can all talk about the episodes that freaked us out. But was there one story either from Twilight Zone or one storyline from Star Trek that really has always stuck with you? So I would have to say from Twilight Zone, uh, the Burgess Meredith episode, Time Enough at Last, for sure, 
was yeah. was one that haunted me for decades. Um, because it, it again, it, it begged the question: What would you do with all the time in the world if the one thing you wanted more than anything else wasn't available to you? I would have to point to that. I'd also say about Twilight Zone, right? Like who who wasn't just freaked out by Rod Serling himself, right? The whole note. <laughs> The whole notion that, that that episode, that series could have been anything close to what it was without Serling is absurd. Um, yeah. Apart, for, apart from his creative contribution, right? He just His voice, his tone, it was perfect for the time. That perfect hair, the starched white shirt and the suit. <laughs> you, just, you, couldn't, you couldn't do it any better. So I would have to say, like, I used to hear Sterling's voice <laughs> after those episodes for days on end. <laughs> Uh, probably not something I don't want to admit to any legislative uh, body <laughs> considering me for, for any type of appointment. Uh, but no, I would say those were, those were, those were key. And then I, uh, in the Star Trek series, um, the one, mo the most memorable for me has to be Wrath of Khan. And, and obviously there's a lot to say, a lot to, a lot to talk about that, but those would be the ones I would point to. I, I well, have did, to ask. Did you like the new Wrath of Khan? I was going oh, to ask you, what do you think of okay. the new Khan? <sighs> No. Oh. Rick Montavon cinched that role. So why would you why would you mess with perfection? I mean, absolutely. And and, and the and of course, I mean, you know, the bulging pecs, the long stringy hair, the deep voice, um, just perfect. Why would you mess with it? Judge Serena, what do you think of the new con versus old con? The the uh I, I like the uh, the old con. I'm not a big fan of. Although I I, I loved the 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 first Star Trek, the new Star Trek. I'm not a big fan of all these reboots. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know why. I'd rather build on a story than start from scratch. And 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 now I heard that they're rebooting Terminator. Um, oh. So I, I'm very curious as to why we need to. And part of it, I guess, is age wise. You know, I saw the. The earlier ones, I want them to build on them, as opposed to the new generation that would like to start over that hasn't seen really the first Terminator, and a reboot will kick it into gear. So I understand from the studio point of view why they want to do it. I'm just not a. I'd, I'd rather they build on a story than start from scratch again. It's like I've seen the origin of Spider-Man now three times. He still gets bit by the spider. Yeah, we and get you know, it, they, right? They, they do various <laughs> things, but I don't need to see him bit by the spider anymore. I'd rather see him. You know, 15 years down the road, and what happens to it? Yeah, there should be a statute limitations on when you can do a reboot, because it'd be one thing to go, "Hey, we haven't seen Buck Rogers done well since like the 1930s. Enough times passed." You know, same with Flash Gordon being able to go, "Hey, you know, the 1936 Flash Gordon was classic. Everyone who was around when that was made, you know, is." is kind of gone who starred in it and everyone else is there up in years so a reboot's appropriate to do stuff from say the 30s or 40s uh, but there's something to be said about creativity which is one of the highlights of start you know of science fiction and there's plenty of creativity out there I mean I'm very I haven't seen um, um, I've seen the previews for Europa report I haven't you know, seen it yet, but it looks phenomenal and it looks very creative. And they actually had uh, scientific consultants on it that helped change the script for some of the stuff that they wanted to do to make it as accurate as possible. Uh, you know, about think about think about it, Josh. Like when it comes to fine works of art, do, does any would anyone seriously entertain a, a, a redone or updated Mona Lisa? I don't think yeah. so. So uh -huh. so when when we have Ender's Game exactly right, exactly as we need it. Is it, are, do we really need a new film? I, I just I don't think so. I, I, I say I let, let let the classics lie. Yeah, yeah, I I agree with that. I mean, it's one thing to go, we're going to go out and do something different, but there's enough out there to be creative. You know, there's enough science fiction books that if we wanted to uh, say take you know Sci-Fi sci Channel about a decade ago, decade and a half, did the Children of Dune series. The Dune series, right. Children yeah. of Dune is one of them. Yes, I was actually going to bring that up. Like, there's Dune, which, of course, is near and dear to my heart, and that's one that they keep trying to do and aren't able to do right. So that the one I don't mind. The was, was the best of the attempts, though. True, true. And they're, they're rebooting that again, too, from what I heard. So, But it, that's a tough one to put into it a is. two and a half, two hour movie. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, I, I, you know, I'd love HBO to do a oh. six part. Game of Thrones type 
series of, of Dune and, and, and the, you know, do it for five years and the whole Dune series. You know, that, that would that, be amazing. I would yeah, love that HBO would be incredible. to do it. Yeah. All right. You know, that's let, not my let new George Martin wrote it. Right. <laughs> so, so let's talk about what does this mean? So, Judge, uh, you know, both of you, uh, how, what does science fiction, you know, these stories mean to you? Well, here's, here's the funny thing, right? Like, so most people who love science fiction couldn't stand science class in grade school, right? <laughs> and so to me, like, that, that, it's just amazing to me that you have such large mass scale interest in science fiction when mo- most of us just couldn't stand physics class or, or biology or what have you. What it means, I think, is, is are, are really the stories. I think that the, the, the effects are, are sort of a nice to have, the stories are a need to have, right? And I think that's why some of the classics, some of the story, some of the episodes and films that we love so much, in many ways, have the worst effects. Um, yeah. You know, I don't, I don't think anybody is pining for a recreation of 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 of, of the of the Star Deck, right? In, in Star <laughs> Trek, that was awful. It was awful when it was broadcast. It's, it's even more awful to look at now, and yet the stories are enduring. So, I think what what really appeals to people, first of all, is the, is the notion that we have a future. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I think I think especially in, the, in these troubling times when people are wondering what kind of future we all will enjoy, there's, there's a certain reassurance that comes from the notion that we even will have a future. Um, and I think I think the other thing that's really appealing for people and especially a lot of lawyers and judges, I might suggest, is that um, the world is a gray place, that, that it isn't black and white. And the best science fiction really, I think, explores that tension. Um, in a way that other genres really, really never do. And, yeah, that's a good if point. You look, if you, you, you look at a lot of the science fiction shows, they were able to do things, Star Trek being a great example, the interracial kiss between Kirk and Aurora, that, that if it was a sitcom with that same kiss, the, the, it, it would have had a very different effect and even with as tame as that was it still was banned in certain markets around the country but the 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 you can show a certain kind of racial harmony or uh, any other type advancement of of the human race um, in a science fiction show that might not exactly be correct for the moment but is something that we as as a people are aspiring to uh, you know, it, Bab- one of the great things about Babylon Five at the the end of season um, four actually had the the last episode that they had filmed because they weren't sure if there was going to be a fifth season or not. So they, they 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 filmed the last episode after the fifth season and then showed it at the end of the fourth season, and it showed the history of humanity from that Babylon Five moment to the point where we actually advanced to the point that we're uh, kind of angelic um, or celestial in, in nature. And it goes through the history from A to Z in a quick type of method. But it does show the good, the bad that happens to the human race throughout. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I agree with, with my Californian counterpart that that's one of the great things about science fiction is it does show us as a race surviving and mm-hmm. not dying out and continuing on in, in, in other planets or, or taking or, or spawning out amongst the universe. But there's that, that, that desire for humanity to always continue. Uh, and, and I think that that's part of the desire that science fiction has and the hold that science fiction has on people. Uh, the, the episode of Plato's stepchildren is what you referred to with the first interracial kiss. And I just, I had to play my geek card and show that I remembered that. So that's uh, <laughs> All right, you've established your geek cred. <laughs> I mean, the Especially bow- on Star Trek. None of us are anywhere yet. <laughs> if, if the bow tie wasn't enough, let's just, uh, yeah. Let's... My, my episode was called Destruction of Falling Stars. Wow. Okay. But, but, but that's because I have it right here. <laughs> I, I had to go on Wikipedia and look it up. So. Oh, the, the, the gentleman who created Oh, that. that's cheating. Come on. It is, it is, it is. I, the I, I can't remember episode names. <laughs> <laughs> the, the gentleman who created uh, Babylon Five, and I've never been able to pronounce his name because it's. I, I go with Mike S. 
Yeah, Mike, uh, he, he brought the Thor comic back and did a very nice job with that run and then did a very nice job on um, uh, bringing, updating Wonder Woman as well. So he's branched out into the comics for the last six, seven years uh, in his time. Just very talented man. Excellent, excellent writer. So, well, so speaking of Babylon 5, so is there a character or a storyline in there or something that like you feel has influenced your life? I know I've, you know, other people have talked about certain characters from uh, sci-fi that have kind of inspired them or a particular story or moment. Is there anything like that from Babylon 5? Because it came in later in, in my life, I, I wouldn't say that any of them were inspiring to, 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 the, that, to the, the point because it was 98, so I was kind of already – who I was to some extent. It, it, the, it did show a bit of a don't give up, always continue on your path. Uh, and and uh, even if people don't think that it's the right path, if you think it's the right path. So, you know, if anything, it added to those kind of core beliefs anyway. Um, I would say that if, if science fiction that had the, the biggest influence, I got to go back to to Robert Heinlein and, and maybe Strange ah. in a Strange Land. Uh, really? Probably my favorite Indeed. as far as, yeah, as far as, as something that meant something as a, I, I read it when I was eight or nine and, and it, it actually was, was, was something that was like, wow, you know, it, 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 it was religious in nature without mm -hmm. being religious and, and did challenge some of my beliefs and, mm -hmm. and some of the religion that I had been taught up to that point. So that, that did have a, a, a bit of an effect, I would think, even subconsciously. Wow, I grok you. All right. I, uh... Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm a big Heinlein fan, but that, and that's the first one I read, too, and it's actually always been my least favorite of, his, of the books. But, um, but I do too. That was the first one. I then yeah. went on and read everything, and Number it was actually a battle. And... Because, yeah, he never stopped writing. No. And then even, even after he died, they were still coming out. <laughs> so it, took, it took me a very long time, and, and I can say that I've, I've read every single book that has been published under his name, including the ones that his son has finished and his wife has finished. But uh, he, he's probably my favorite science fiction author. Wow, I had no idea. I love him, but I cannot make that same claim, although I think now I have to add that to my goals, too. I've read almost everything of his, but I've not read his young adult books, and I don't think I've read the ones that his family finished. So... But, um, but yeah, he, he even has a nonfiction political book on running a grassroots election. That was, <laughs> that's out of print. That one's tough, tough to find. But it was actually still very accurate on on uh, on on, uh, on on a lot of that grassroots technique is still used today. So it was a very good book. Wow. Well, he is really one of those science fiction authors who did challenge a lot of what we kind of, you know, take as normal and accepted. I mean, he certainly was one that liked to, yeah, explore and push kind of the boundaries of human relationships and all of that. So, cool. Well, Judge Grohl, how about you? Was there something from Star Trek or Twilight Zone or some other sci-fi story that kind of has influenced you or impacted you? Yeah, I would have to say um, I, if, if I had to sort of go off – grid a bit from the original Star Trek, um, I would be more inclined to go next generation oh. than say Babylon 5. And um, again, uh, partly of that, that, that's partly generational. I think that, you know, that was the first series I saw as it rolled out yeah. um, and as it was released. And, 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 and I, ha I have to say, I mean, Jean-Luc Picard was just the epitome of cool to me. <laughs> and, yeah. Right. And I would, if, if there was an influence from that, I would have to say it was the grace under pressure that he demonstrated week after week. Just fantastic. Yeah. I also was just totally into Jordy and the technology and being able to see even after losing sight. Mm -hmm. Pretty, pretty amazing. And I, you know, I think, I think LeVar Burton was, was an underrated actor. I mean, I think he didn't, he didn't get the credit he deserved for that, for that performance. Um, obviously much, much more focus paid attention to his work in roots. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would have to say, I would have to say Picard, Jordy, Definitely strong influences on me. Um, um, no, no better, no, no better uh, example of judicial temperament than Picard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, right? I mean, what more, what more could you ask for um, than, than, than the way Picard – and I think, if I'm not mistaken, at least in one or two episodes, Picard did assume a quasi-judicial role yeah. where he was asked to essentially render judgments and called, called a session uh, uh, on the deck into order. So – yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely hold him up as, as 
as a um, as a model. Interestingly, there aren't a lot of, at least to my knowledge, judicial role models in science fiction. Right there, are, I, I'm not aware, at least, of any specific character in a major film or TV series where the where the where the character was assuming the role of judge per se. So yeah, I would put Picard up there uh, up with anybody. How about the Stephen King's The Stand? Because isn't one of the the leaders of you know the forces of good a judge? And that, and it, and I didn't. That's digging way back for me. But that's good one. pull. No, that's fair. That's fair. I mean, pretty rare though, right? That's, oh, a, that's yeah. a good point. Well, that you know, the ever sci-fi disaster movie. Apparently, all every lawyer and judge gets wiped out fairly quickly, and that always seemed a little weird to me. <laughs> but that's uh, uh, I don't know why that is, but. Judge Dredd, hello. <laughs> oh, are we really going to bring up Judge Dredd? Instant justice, right. Jury, 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 judge, jury, and execution. That's right. Yeah, not a lot of separation of powers being exhibited by Judge Dredd. No. Oh. Very quick deliberations as well. Yeah. And, and apparently no civil proceedings either. So that's... Uh, yeah. But uh, going back to Star Trek, I... You know, I watched Next Generation as it rolled out as well, but Deep Space Nine had a little more impact on me because that trailed uh, end of high school through law school for me, and um, that was the one that I mean I love the original series, and but there were like three, three or four judicial episodes in DS Nine where you know dealing with due process where O'Brien is I think it's tribunal is you know taken prisoner by Cardassians and tried for war crimes Dax where she's being tried for one of her former hosts um and a couple other ones as well and that one you know coming on the late 90s in a relative time of peace you know they go to war and the issue of a peaceful society in a hegemic war uh has a lot more meaning now uh, especially with things that have taken place, like the episode of uh, Homefront, and you know, dealing with blood screenings of everyone and dealing with changelings. So just, uh, just, just neat. I, I thought that one was quite on the mark, uh, especially comparing to what we've done for the past decade. So, but anyway, that's uh, that's good. Now, IO9 had had a question come out today about. Uh, favorite soundtracks to science fiction. So I'll post this to our judicial panel. <laughs> well, what's in your playlist for sci-fi soundtracks? If you're working on an opinion, doing legal research, what uh, uh, is it? Chariots? You know, I don't think Chariots of Fire is playing in the background, but there's got to be something. Uh, I'm, I'm, pl I'm playing the Fall of Anakin Skywalker usually. <laughs> If it's a real meaty decision, uh, the, 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 or Duel of Fates is very good. Uh, I, 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 so it's, it's definitely, to me, the, the, uh, the, the Star Wars uh, soundtracks, and it, it's weird. It's, it, I actually buy the CDs of those, those soundtracks and do write decisions to uh, some, 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 of the, some of the music playing in the background, depending on the decision. But uh, to, me, for, for, to me, there's no greater... Uh, example of how bad a movie could be without the soundtrack. If you ever tried to watch Star Wars without that music, it just is not anywhere near as good as it is with that music. And John Williams just does an incredible job as, as a composer. And, I, and I've heard rumors that he's back on board for the next Star Wars movie, so I'm oh. hoping that that's true. And uh, because I, I don't think any can ever anything can beat his work as far as those movies. Wow. I have to say the uh, courthouse in Brooklyn is much more wired into what's coming down the pipe than uh, anything we've got here in San Jose. I, I'd, have, I, I, I'd, I'd have to say, in terms of setting the mood for a serious piece of writing, you can't beat the opening sequence to 2001. I mean, if you're not inspired to do great things <laughs> by the first by the first seven or eight notes of that piece, then I'm not sure what will do it for you. <laughs> I'd concur. I mean, I think I think it's fair to say Star Trek. I'm sorry, Star Wars um, benefits most from the soundtrack that's provided. But um, I, I I have to say I think it's interesting, right? The relationship between music and the story in so much science fiction is so strong. Um, I, I, I think there are very few films that you could watch with the sound turned down or with the music off that you would enjoy nearly as much. Um, it, it really, they really do seem to go hand in hand. And some great themes, everything from fire, uh, the beginning of Firefly, that song is just 
great. I mean, just, just the bars hit and it instantly it brings you to the world of, of Firefly and, and kind of it sets the, the mood for the episode. Uh, and, and most of the theme shows, uh, theme songs, I think were, were that way. Interesting with Babylon 5, each of the five years, the, the theme, the opening, kind of changed and it set the mood for that season and that was different than than anything that i had ever seen before well. yeah yeah i think that's right i mean you know and, and and you can go i mean you can go down the list right there's i mean i think that was true for blade runner great great soundtrack totally underrated um absolutely true for total recall even RoboCop. Anybody watched RoboCop lately? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, ca- I caught it for the first time in like years. Pretty solid soundtrack. So I think it. I think it spans the genre. I do think Darth Vader, without that music, that dum dum da dum, that I mean, he would not be who he is. That music totally sets He's the stage for him. He's a guy in a plastic hat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's well. I mean, all of us would be more impressive with with a soundtrack. You know, and, and, My life would be much more exciting. It's I turning it to TV. You know, the the first couple seasons because the music changes of um of Quantum Leap uh, always endeared. You know, well, well, not long enough to write a blog post or a brief or anything like that. To definitely very endearing and the nostalgic feeling uh, to create. But I, I'd have to. Uh, agree with attaching emotion to a scene in music's very good. You know, the death of Spock and the, you know, funeral uh, with the musical score was extremely well done. I went home, I was eight when that movie came out, I went home crying the entire car ride because of that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's in, that happens. And so you're able to to attach that. Or the uh, I thought the most powerful example recently that I've seen for that was the uh, HBO series The Pacific. You know, mm-hmm. that musical beginning, you know, just ripped your heart out right at the get-go and was extremely well done. So there's there's a lot of... Absolutely right. Absolutely right. I mean, look, I, I think one, if you want to have litmus tests in judicial selection, <laughs> you, ought to, you ought to play the funeral scene from Star Trek when Spock <laughs> is, is, is shot. And in particular, Kirk's eulogy. And if there's not a tear in the in the uh, individual's eye, I say, keep them from the bench. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Josh. Are you Josh? Is speechless. It's phenomenal. Uh, it's just, if, if we cannot take traditional notice of that, I, I don't know what we can. <laughs> I have to say, this is totally a little bit off topic, but it is my new favorite Star Trek moment. Um, and so I'm going to put you two on the spot. Assuming you've seen this, which commercial do you like better? Do you like the Volkswagen Darth Vader commercial or the new old Spock versus new Spock Audi commercial? I don't know if you've seen that new one yet, but it is my absolute. If I've I need seen to the pick VW me up. ad and it's brilliant. I have okay. not seen the Audi oh. ad, so. I hate to give a plug for commercials here, but oh my God, that new ad. Judge Serena, have you seen the new one? It, it, it's it's phenomenal, but <laughs> but that that little kid and that oversized Darth Vader, when 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 his, you can almost see his eyes light up <laughs> under the helmet when the car starts up. So I, th- that was just phenomenally done. That that commercial, I, I, that's probably the best commercial I've seen in a couple of years. All right, see, and I have to say, I love Old Spock so much and that new Audi commercial. That I mean, again, you know, I don't know if it matters. I I think I'm pretty evenly split well, between Star it's, it's Wars very, and Star it's Trek. It's very but, well done. The, the yeah. two of them, when they, they arrive at the club <laughs> yes. and, and, and the Google car goes by, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's exceptionally well done. But just I, I just I could see that pleasure in that kid's face when that car goes on. Having True. tried to use the force so many times yeah. in my life without success, to actually have it work. Would be, would be it resonated, phenomenal. right? In, in fact, on that on just on that note, I I keep in my part a a calendar in front of the lawyers' desks where they where the open dates that they can choose from are are uh, available. And so there's September dates and some July dates or whatever. And for the month of August, there's a little placket that says, this is not the month you're looking for. <laughs> Move along. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying my best to use the Jedi mind trick to get them to pick September and October for the next trial day. <laughs> Oh, that 
it, I said, do most of them appreciate what you're doing there? Do they understand it? Yeah, you know, August, it's, it's we, we don't have as many trial parts open because we don't have as many judges. So we, we do try to limit the, the cases to the people that are in jail and yeah. to just do those. So people that are out uh, are going to have to wait for the fall to get there. But I mean, but trial. do you think the lawyers understand the reference? Do most of them understand the reference? A lot of them do. I'm sure some of them won't. Yeah. But, 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 but I think a lot of them do. I think, you know, Star Wars is, is, is one that I think most of the population uh, has seen and, and that these these are not the droids you're looking for is even permutated to phones nowadays. So uh, <laughs> Android has run some great commercials with, you know, these are the droids you're looking for. So so I, I think people that. people kind of get the, the reference, I think. But Yeah. <laughs> but here's my pet peeve, though, because I do think many lawyers are sci-fi fans, but others aren't. And – I suspect word has gotten around that certain judges are into science fiction <laughs> in a, to a certain degree. And there's, there, there's just one thing I can't stand, which is if you, if you aren't true blue, don't even try. Because <laughs> I have seen a reference or two in a brief that just has fallen totally flat. And it's like nails on the chalkboard. <laughs> That is an excellent word of warning. No posers allowed. I love None. it. You're a real geek or don't even try. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That's excellent. You just can't fake it, right? I mean, no. you are or you aren't. So be true to yourself. That's all that's fun, people. Oh, that's um, excellent. I would, I would love to work Kobayashi Maru into a brief, but that's uh, that's just me. But <laughs> uh, Awesome. Well, uh, your honors, uh, this has been phenomenal. Uh, do you have any parting comments before we close this uh, video podcast? Hearing none. Uh, <laughs> thank you we for helping. Thank you th for helping. I, I thought that was a great place to end it, so I don't want to. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And on a height. Thank you. Good night. We're out of here, right? Yeah. Right. Only true geeks should, should, should act geeky. That's true. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's like they say, right? Don't write an 11-page brief when 10 will do. I think we nailed it. <laughs> and that's why we have editing. So, gentlemen, <laughs> Your Honor, Jessica, thank you all in America. Stay geeky. Stay geeky. Thank you America. so much, Your Honors. Thank you. <laughs>